Hello and welcome. Thank you for joining us here at Macaulay uh, Arthur Series. My name is Charmaine Litlow, and on behalf of Dean Mary Pearl and the whole Macaulay community, we are thrilled to have with us three of our students, all from the Lehman campus, join us tonight to listen in to Shane Martin and talk about his recent book, Lost Souls, A Servant of Death. Of death. So just to give you a little bit of background um, on all three of them, I'm just gonna read off their bio. So just bear me one moment. So Shane Martin, he graduated from Macaulay Honors College in 2020, and he's a graduate of the Lehman campus. So Shane grew up on books, TV, and video games, struggling, struggling to fit all three of these things into each and every day. He's a pianist, mixed martial artist, and tennis player on the side. He's always got something to do when not gaming or Netflixing. Shane received a Bachelor of Arts degree in both philosophy and history at Lehman College and first started pursuing his English minor in creative writing there halfway through undergraduate school. He is now pursuing a Master's of Arts in Interdisciplinary um, Studies at New York University, focusing heavily on how he can enhance his writing with various elements of history, philosophy, and more. And with him, we have Jeevanisam Deva Kanmali, and she's right now currently a current student at the Lehman College campus. So G, as everyone likes to call her, she's a 1.5 generation immigrant of Talamandu, India. In middle school, she was the kid who sat in the corner devouring a new novel each day. And in high school, she was the scientist. She's now that person who knows everyone in school and she thrives in the presence of others. G is majoring in philosophy and will be beginning her PhD in philosophy in the fall studying ethics. Outside of school, G loves playing music, writing, and making art. Art and drawing, painting specifically, has always been the only space where time ceased to exist in her life. Though she was unable to pursue it professionally, her friends supported her skills by buying her art and helping her develop an Etsy, score, um, Etsy store. She is now growing more confident in calling herself an artist, and working with Shane has been the most rewarding experience yet. Along, the, uh, along with them, moderating tonight will be Victoria Smith. She's the class of 2020, also from Lehman College. And Victoria graduated Phi Beta Kappa, magna cum laude, and she received her Bachelor of Arts degree in philosophy with minors in music and political science. Smith was an active member of the Humans of Macaulay, the Macaulay Schol Scholars Council, and co-president of the Macaulay Ambassador Club. Smith was a recipient of the Jeanette K. Watson Fellowship, and hopefully she'll let us know about that um, a little bit later. And the Bronx Defenders and the, Son the Sankey Gender Justice in Cape Town, South Africa. Currently, Smith is an associate teacher at the Ethical Culture Fieldston School in the Bronx, New York. And I'd like to welcome them all here tonight. Thank you so much for being with us. Am I on mute? Okay, now I'm unmuted. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for tuning in. And thank you for that wonderful introduction, Charmaine. So again, I'm Victoria Smith, class of 2020. I'm here with G and here with Shane. And I'm really excited about this. I am so excited for this talk. It's not every day I get to geek out about the amazing accomplishments of my friends. So this is, this is going to be fun. So again, thank you for tuning in and let's get started. So um, just a little bit of background about how we all know each other. So as Charmaine mentioned, we all went to or are currently going to Lehman College. Shane and I graduated last year and then G is graduating um, in a few months, which is super duper exciting. And it's just, I'm trying to think, was there ever a time where we all had a class together? No, there's not. We never had a crossover. No, that's so funny. I feel like because the campus is a little bit smaller, we just like bump into each other. But I know that Shane and I have had all four Macaulay classes together. <laughs> Shout out Ira Bloom for that paper <laughs> um, at the end of our sophomore year. So um, 
we've had four classes together. We've taken some anthropology classes together. And I feel like we also bonded over our shared history of both being mixed martial artists um, and also being really into writing and just art and trying to find a way to bring all of these interests together in an interdisciplinary manner. So um, yeah, five years and counting of us being friends. So that's how Shane and I know each other. And then I met G actually literally in a cafeteria getting sushi. Um, <laughs> We had a common friend, and again, this is, I feel like, really how the Macaulay um, and just Lehman ethos works in general. It's like everyone knows someone who knows someone. So um, it turns out we had a mutual friend. I complimented her shirt because it was a really cool pink shirt, and it was like a highlighter color. And I was like, oh my gosh, I'm obsessed with your shirt. And then you're like, thank you, I love your shoes. And we started talking for like five minutes, and we literally have been friends ever since. Um, so that's how I know the both of them. And then the way that the both of them know each other, and I'll let them explain it, um, in just a second was when Shane was coming out with this book, he reached out to me back in September, I want to say. Um, and he was like, Hey, do you know anyone who, you know, could be an artist for this book? Do you know any good illustrators? And because I have the drawing skills of a walrus, I was like, no, I cannot draw, but I do know someone who is a fantastic artist. And that's where G came in. So that's enough of my spiel about how I know them and how they know each other. I'll let them take it from there. Uh, th thanks, Victoria. I, I really appreciate it. And and before I even start talking, um, this this is for Andy who just decided to DM me. I'll give you your thumbs up now. now don't stop bugging me about it. Um, I so yeah, this this book was was definitely um, quite the project. It started oh, I want to say like three years ago. I wrote like the first nine chapters and then forgot about it for a year and then came back to it after taking another creative writing course and having a certain friend read my writing and be like, wow, this is really good. Why don't you continue it? So I was like, wow, that's a good idea. So I I finished writing it the the first draft, I want to say like a year and a half ago, maybe. And it took a while for me to actually decide to to publish it being slightly self-conscious about myself and it was my first go at writing but especially with the the rise of self-publishing as as an option instead of going the traditional way i decided you know I, I should stop being a wimp and just put my work out there and obviously every good book has a great cover and i i was in desperate need of of a great illustrator because all the people i knew much like victoria I had drawing skills of various uh, animals. Um, so I, I reached out to her because I know she knows a lot of people. And she put me in touch with G, which has definitely been a very, as she said, rewarding experience. I, at, at this point in time, I can't imagine have, having any other illustrator uh, work with me because, you know, she she's read the books. She's helping me out with my current writing at present. She's connected with the characters almost as much as me, if not more. Um, and watching her bring them to life has been a truly rewarding experience. Uh, thank you, Shane, for that. <laughs> and thank you, Victoria. Um, lots of great, um, so many compliments I can't handle it but yeah like they said I um and I've always been a reader so I I don't know how many of the participants here are like read like Percy Jackson in middle school but if you liked reading Percy Jackson like everybody just raises their hand like Percy Jackson think Lord of the Rings think like the fantasy and mythology like type of stories that we really found comfort in. I feel like a bunch of us in middle school <laughs> um, think that, and then it's brought to life again in a young, more young adult type version. And that's, you know, and I didn't honestly know all of this when I was first reached out. Um, I love anything related to art. It's the one place where I kind of really just find peace and so when Victoria reached out to me, um, I was like, yeah, sure, definitely. And she also mentioned, oh, this, you know, we're all struggling college students. I'm like, completely get it. I would love to, I don't mind doing, um, because for me, it's like, I, I know that there are some dreams that I have that 
literally the only reason they wouldn't come to pass was because of like monetary issues. And I never, and when I knew that a friend of a friend had this great dream and wanted to bring it to life. And the only thing standing in between that dream coming to life and um, was the art. And I was like, I, I want to be a part of this. <laughs> so, and I also want to be famous when he gets famous. So I'm definitely not completely altruistic, <laughs> but, but yeah. And I got to, um, I drew the cover before I read it. So I will have to be like honest, but I did not regret at all. Like I, there are some times when, you know, if we're honestly speaking that you draw, do something for a friend's writing or something, and then you read it and you're like, you, you know, you're like, oh, this isn't the greatest, but I read his book and I finished it in one sitting. Like that, that was how good the book was. And now we're working on new books and this is like super exciting. And I'm really happy that we get to share it with the rest of you today. I love that. I'm so excited. Oh my gosh. No, I'm just going to be geeking out after, after the both of you just talk. I'm just, uh, cause if you had told me in September that this is what it was going to turn into, I mean, I, I would have believed it just because, you know, again, so Shane, um, I've always known him to be an incredible writer. And I would say that one of our favorite things to do aside from procrastinating for various tests, um, is he would just write things. He would write short stories or he would be working on chapters of this book or other books. And he would just send them to me, be like, Hey, would you mind like giving this a read? And, and similar to what G mentioned before, it's like, you know, friends might ask you to look over something and you want to be supportive, but sometimes it's not always the best. Let's be real here. I know I've sent my friends music pieces in the past and they sound like trash, but they just nod and smile to make me feel better. It was never like that with Shane's writing. Like I've always genuinely enjoyed just the stories that he's able to create with words. And it's always been just so admirable. And similarly with G, whenever I see her do artwork, I'm just like, this is amazing. Like this is something that you clearly have a passion for and a gift for. So seeing these two come together has just, has just been an amazing experience. Okay, my ranting aside, now I wanna get to some of the main questions. So um, for those of, the people who might be you know listening who haven't read the book yet or haven't been able to get the book yet um can you give them a short synopsis obviously without any spoilers of what this book is about and either shane or g can answer that question um so this this spoilerless uh version i suppose um so my my main character uh his name is ander frost and he is a pirate during late ancient Rome. So, you know, post Julius Caesar, post Augustus, you know, the two big names. Um, and one one thing that I, I really wanted to, to add to, to this ancient setting was the element of fantasy. So I, I added that you, you got elves and, and dwarves and magic roaming around within this ancient context. But on top of that, there's this separate island out in the middle of the Atlantic called Capital Island, where you have a high king. And this high king holds greater authority than the Roman emperor, right? Because the Roman emperor is just part of the world, doesn't rule the world. Um, and my main character, Andrew Frost, Eventually, the past ca the past catches up with him, and he gets uh, captured by the High King's forces, and he's he's given a choice because at this time there's a bit of an insurgency going on in Rome, and the the Roman Emperor is is overthrown, and a new tyrant takes place that does not have the same interests as the High King, and even though Andrew Frost. Uh, became a pirate, his skill was still uh, unquestionable. Uh, so the High King wanted to cut a deal, basically, you know, work for me, help me put a stop to the Emperor, or the Usurper, I should say. Um, and I'll spare you and, and, and your wife and your crew. Um, and to avoid spoilers, I, I will stop there. because But that's that's what sets everything in motion. There we go. Uh, yeah, I think that was a good spoiler-less version of it. So 
Um, how did you get the inspiration for Captain Anderfrost? Because I definitely think that, I'm not sure if y'all ever read this book series either, Divergent. Does that ring a bell? The book series? Okay, so I'm reading it for the fourth time now over spring break because fantastic series. And um, there were some elements of the book and there's some elements of Captain Andrew Frost's character that kind of reminded me of the main character of Divergent. Like you're tasked with this choice to go one way, to, to sort of stick with the status quo or to do something you know, differently in order to try and save your families, um, your family and your friends, but you can't exactly communicate that with everyone around you because it might be dangerous. So just this idea of having to make a choice, um, how did you get that inspiration for the character and where do you think that came from? Well, I, I can definitely say my inspiration for Andrew Frost and all the characters that surround him was it came, came from two main sources. One being the conversations I actually have with my actual friends and family, because sometimes they take very stupid turns and then the humor comes out. Um, so that, that definitely comes out, especially in uh, Andrew Frost's character. I, I tried to make him answer everything with humor in most situations but also very much like myself in a sense. I know that's a bit egoistic, but I'm an author, so I have to have an ego. Um, in, in, in the sense that th this guy is not very serious in a lot of situations. So that way, when he is serious, you, you know something warrants that seriousness. You know something has gone awry and he needs to fix it. Um, and the second source of inspiration obviously came from gaming because I'm a very big gamer. So the idea of a choice is, is integral to not just gaming, but to just narrative and, and storytelling in general, right? You, you need conflict. Um, and the, the choice I gave Andrew Frost at the start, um, I felt was a great place to start because for, for lack, of, lack of a better cliche, he's caught between a rock and a hard place. Because obviously, you know, he he became. If someone becomes a pirate, they want nothing to do with authority. Um, and this man is being told by one figure of authority to dispose of another figure of authority. So he's essentially being brought into a political squabble. Um, and he knows if he doesn't do this, then he's going to lose everyone he cares about. And I think that creates. Uh, a, a decent amount of empathy for the guy right out the gate, to say the least. I like yeah, that. I like how one, you. Like... Oh, sorry, sorry. No, no, no. Good. C continue. No, like... I wanted, yeah. Okay, yeah, and uh, kind of adding on, like one of the reasons I really like the character, and you feel really drawn to the character, is because it's very much realistic. Like because the opposite of what that would mean, because, like he said. Um, if he didn't choose the, if he didn't choose what the king was offering him, that would mean his whole family dies. And but then the opposite of that, if he did choose that, and if he said yes to it, that would mean that he is not being true to himself. And while it might seem like a super easy, obviously, if we, if we haven't read the book, it seems like a super easy. Obviously, I'm going to choose the life of my family over being true to my ideals, but you have to understand the struggles that he did get he went through in the first place to become a pirate like that takes a lot and that's where the historical context comes in like you leaving a society and you like fighting against the norm that takes a lot of struggle to begin with that, that life comes with danger that life comes with fatal consequences already so it's like it was a hard decision because of that and so when you understand it from that perspective you do start to as as dramatic as it seems, you start to realize how many of these choices we have to make as well. So yeah, that was the additional. <laughs> no, it was actually a perfect segue. So um, I wanted to ask the next question to you, G, just so when you're coming up with the cover art, when you're illustrating for a book, it's how much of it is based off of, if you can even answer this question, I feel like it's a loaded question, but it's how much of it do you think comes from your own personal experiences and just what's important to you 
um, and how much of it is based off of the book and sort of the story that the author has created, if that makes any sense. Yeah, so funny thing, and uh, I know um, I've complained about this a lot to Shane. I am not the best at mental imagery, so I cannot really picture things when I'm, so when I'm drawing, it just, whatever comes on the page, I haven't seen it before it comes on there. I'm like experiencing it real time. <laughs> Um, I usually need to draw from reference. So this has actually been my biggest um, challenge with, he's like working with him has challenged my artistic ability because of that, because I'm so used to drawing from reference and all of a sudden you're just like, okay, so you're just gonna have to imagine how these characters look like. And I'm like, I cannot, I can't imagine how they look like. Um, and just working, I had to work for the first book, especially I had to work closely with Shane and just have him describe the character to me, um, tell me people that I, that would remind him of the character. Um, and I know, like he said, he based off, based the character off of him a lot. So I'm like imagining his quirk. So in, if you notice the first, the, the cover of the first book, I don't even show his face as much because I was just so uncomfortable with like, I want to get this right. But once I worked with, worked, worked on that, get you get the armor you, and it was a learning opportunity for me as well because I'm looking up okay what does the armor look like during this time like during this historical period um so that was really nice and um with obviously with the one and this is Shane will talk more about it um when it time comes but with after the first book then I got to read the book and then started learning more characters and that was enough exercise for me to try drawing those characters as well um, especially because this book is the first in a series, now that I'm reading the book and getting to know the characters with the ch learning with Shane about, about like the history and about the different types of armor, even like he always sends me these uh, pictures from the video games as well, like art from the video games, which has been, again, really helpful. Um, so it's a combination of that combination of like, okay, he tells me this is how this person's character is. So I'm like, oh, okay. So she's very, you know, she's like, she smirks because she's like, she knows what she's doing. Like she's uh, manipulative, like things like that. And yeah, it's, it's really fun to include all of that, but generally out of everything else, it's just been the biggest learning experience. <laughs> I love that. And I think that's really interesting. How I, again, I have, like I said, the drawing skills of a walrus, but my mom is a great artist and I've always envied that because even like now she'll be able to look at something and then come up with a picture in her head and then communicate that onto the page. I'm like, what's that like? Like, what's it like being God's favorite? Like I could never. So it's really like comforting, but also just impressive to me that you're, you don't see things in your head when you're drawing and you're kind of creating this in real time. So I feel like it, if anything, I feel like that's maybe, you know, a testament to just the strength of this book that you're able to read the book and really interact with the characters and get a sense of them so much that even if you don't have the perfect, whatever that means, you know, image in your head, you're still able to create something. So um, you both talked about video games. So Shane, I wanted to ask this question to you. So how has your passion for video games influenced the creation of any of the characters in your book? So this is your opportunity to rant about video games, which... I know you love to do, so let's let's hear it. <laughs> oh boy, um, the the inspiration has been tremendous to say the least. I think the strongest um, inspiration in regarding the world of video games for this game was probably Assassin's Creed Odyssey because that that takes place in ancient Greece, um, uh, a couple centuries before, to say the least, the events of. Um, my book, but considering my main character and a few of the supporting characters are Greek, um, it, it was extremely helpful to look at this amazing digital recreation of the world of ancient Greece and literally walk through it and, you know, talk to Spartans, talk to Athenians, Spartans and Athenians. Um, and and interact with with the world in that way because it helped me at least when it came to description of of setting or 
or armor or even fighting, to be honest. Um, but aside from that, video games as, as a whole, along with the limited Netflix that I watch, which is usually around uh, comic series, um, just the, the idea of the journey of the hero, right? Like some kind of big quest and some life-changing journey that this single person goes on has, has always hit home for me because that's the premise of a lot of the video games and comic series that I play slash watch, right? Like you, you have your main character and you can see their character transform over the course of whatever journey they're taking. So generally speaking, that's a lot of um, the inspiration. As for the journey itself, you know, I, for, for those of us who are also gamers, you know, you might be able to see within the novel, you know, oh, this was clearly a side quest, you know what I mean? Or this was clearly a fetch quest, you know, it obviously doesn't have a tremendous amount to do with the main plot, but although it has, you know, some degree, you, you, you can tell why it's there, even though, right? Because I know, at least from personal experience, when I get sent on a fetch quest, I'm, I'm kind of annoyed. I want to get back to the main story. And I don't want to, you know, get some guy a jar of oil for whatever he needs it for. You know, I, I want to go back to killing the dragon, essentially. Um, so with that flaw, in my opinion, of a lot of video games in mind, I tried my best to avoid that in in the book and in what I'm continuing to write as well, because people, I, I, I feel like it's better if, if you focus more on the main story instead of tangenting on, you know, really, really, really long past descriptions or some fetch quest that would annoy your hero just as much as it would annoy the, the reader slash viewer. Um, so in, in total, I guess video games, they, they help me a lot in terms of pacing and in terms of trimming unnecessary things. I like that. Uh, I wish I were more of a gamer so I could relate <laughs> to some to some of the jokes. I mean, I am surrounded by a bunch of gamers, so I I feel the passion. I feel it, <laughs> but I can't I can't personally resonate with it. But there is something that I think that you mentioned that even if you're not a serious gamer, you can relate to, and it's just taking aspects of things that you love and things that you enjoy. And because you've done them for so long and because you're immersed in them, you can examine it a little bit more critically and be like, oh, you know what? I hate fetch quests with a passion. So when I'm writing my book, I'm gonna make sure that there's no element of fetch quests and you can really like fall in love with the character and allow them to stay on their journey. So I like that. Um, so for the next question, I wanna bring it over to G and again, talk a little bit more about just illustrating in general. Um, so I'm not sure if you have a gaming background um, or not. No. Okay, cool. Girl, we on the same page. Okay. So <laughs> even though you don't have, you know, a gaming background, your illustration, um, you know, it's still, I think does a fantastic job of bringing, you know, the character to life, even though you can't see their face. So I just wanted to know um, what inspired you for this character in particular? Like, did you like, how were you able to sort of understand these video games, even though you don't have that background? And how are you able to bring this together to create Ander Frost? Yeah, so I, that's a great question. Um, and I think that's where I would bring it back to the, um, to my middle school days <laughs> where I was obsessed with Greek mythology. And why was I obsessed? Because of Percy Jackson. Like anyone, <laughs> anyone who were in, anyone who was obsessed with Greek mythology during that time, like, 2012 to like 2016 maybe I think that was like the the era of that um they all read um Percy Jackson and if you remember Percy Jackson is like the demigod um the son of Poseidon so water and he told me pirate so actually that did play a role it's like okay I like ocean drawing and so that was great and I was like oh so there's Greek mythology in it perfect that I those things played a role in how much, because I remember how much I read these books. Like when I tell you 
I inhaled them. Like it's insane. Um, and this was during a time when I was also going through difficult times. Like I'm an immigrant and uh, this was like sixth to eighth grade. I had only come to America when I was in fifth grade. So I'm barely speaking English, uh, not too many friends, socially not like the greatest. Um, whatever little I spoke, obviously you're ridiculed for it. And during that time, um, I was driven by two things. One, I didn't really want to, you know, I, I was very antisocial, which no one that know me now would believe when I say I was antisocial, but I was very much antisocial. And two, I wanted to learn English very much. So uh, those two things I was able to find in books like that. I was able to find my own world where I got to interact with characters that couldn't hurt me, right? And then I also got to learn English. Like that's how my primary education in English was reading books. I was just reading one after the other um, because it what it teaches you is you learn English, but also you learn like how to speak more colloquially instead of like the, the proper English that you would get taught in the ESL class. And so because of that, I've always really been drawn to books like this, where there's fantasy, where there's like history involved. Um, history used to be my favorite subject all, in all of like middle school and high school um, until I discovered philosophy. So that's fun that we're all philosophy majors, but um, history used to like history and fantasy and all these things were like my safe space. So when I found out about that <laughs> from Shane, when I found out that there was like these elements in there, I was like, okay, I absolutely have to, even though I haven't read it yet, I'm gonna do my, I'm gonna like hope for the best, draw this character. And in this book, I drew Andrew Frost, who while he isn't, you know, a demigod or anything, the Greek, um, there's Greek elements. So I'm like, okay, I get to bring this to life. And then I read the book and I, did not at all. I was hoping I wouldn't regret it. And I not even an ounce of regret for doing this. So that that was the general the reasons why it was easier for me to like draw these characters. I love that. Also, I didn't I didn't know that. I didn't know that one of the ways that you're able to learn English was by like reading fantasy books and reading the Percy Jackson series. That's amazing. And I feel like I, I feel like to a certain extent that's something a lot of people can relate to. Not necessarily, you know, being an immigrant or learning another language through uh, through a book, but still finding representation and finding yourself immersed when you're in an environment that doesn't always represent you. Whether that's you know being immersed in a video game or you know a, a book series when you're coming to a new a new country. Or you know, for me, I got really really into that di divergent book series, um, middle school, high school, because I was going to a new school and I didn't have. A lot of friends and it was like a really rough time for me socially so it was a really powerful way for me to just kind of forget about what was going on externally and to like engross myself in the characters and to kind of find myself in the characters because a lot of um characters I feel like in these books are all going through a transformation as Shane mentioned earlier that's something that drives you know the narration there needs to be some sort of conflict that the character is solving and I think that's something and this is the philosophy major I think coming out in all of us but I think we're all dealing with crises that we're trying to find answers for and it's nice sometimes to immerse yourself um in a world where you don't have to immediately focus on the things that you yourself internally are trying to figure out um, so shifting back to Shane in kind of a different direction, it's who was your initial target audience when you were creating the book? Like who did who did you write this book for? Well, um, you see, that's a great question because I didn't have a target audience when I was writing this because of the the, the nature of being a novice, I, I suppose, in in the writing arena. So when I was writing this, I wasn't thinking who do I want to read this. I was thinking why am I writing this? Um, and once I figured that out, I guess, and once I published it even, then then I kind of started uh, figuring that I need to figure out who my uh, target audience would be. And I was just thinking about what what's in it, right? And and like G said, there's, there's elements of uh, mythology, there's elements of history. Uh, of course, there's elements of philosophy. I, 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 love, I love me some good thinkers. Um, but I, I would definitely say target audience in, in an, ex, 
extremely uh well what's the right word here not broad let's put it that way because my english is failing me now uh and in 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 a in a not broad kind of sense um i i was going for almost a mature percy jackson audience or, or a more mature i don't want to say mature and make you think i'm thinking like 40 years old um but it the reason for that is essentially like, for example, the Harry Potter series, it was very obvious as you were reading that, that the author was maturing with her audience. Um, so I was granted, I didn't have a prior book to mature from. Um, but the basis of this for me was the Percy Jackson series as well, because I love the idea of mythology. I just wanted to put it in a historical lens because of how much I love uh, ancient history. So in in an ideal world, right, the target audience would be someone who loves classical history, someone who loves fantasy, and someone who loves action and some pretty, you know, good slash stupid wit. I love that. So now that you do have a book to reference, um, now that you have this first book out, and it's um, and people are reading it and you have a better sense of who your target audience is. Do you think that's affected the sequels? Like, do you think that's affected your writing for your subsequent books? Oh, one, 100%. Because, you know, I, I just, I'm, I'm still going through the editing phase for the second book, but I have, I have the entire manuscript, manuscript and I've been looking it over. Um, and I realized I've been putting a lot of focus on the Greco-Roman with a side of Egyptian classical history. Um, I, I've put I've put a very big focus on that, and I want to expand. Yes, uh, Greco-Roman history is my favorite of that time, but I just I love the history of that time period, right? So I want to expand to perhaps um, ancient Asian history, perhaps ancient Scandinavian history, ancient Mayan. The whole nine yards, and I know now. Um, th this was a last minute decision, but for for the third book, I know I'm jumping ahead. I know th I want there to be more than just Greco-Roman and Egyptian influences within it. Yes, obviously, I'm going to keep the fantastical sphere because I love fantasy, and I think that the the fantastical elements of the series are its main driving factors. Um, but I do want to make the historical aspect more relevant in, in that sense and more diverse as well. I love that. Okay, so I have another question for you, Shane, and then I wanna follow it up with a question that both of y'all can answer. So um, do you think there are many moments in this book in which you draw upon the realm of philosophy? Because that's something, can't believe I forgot this in the beginning, I'm going to blame it on quarantine brain, but we are all philosophy majors. So that is another way that we know each other from literally being in the same small department. So do you think that there's any moments in this book where you're like, okay, I definitely, you know, was able to draw upon a philosophy class that I had with X professor or Y professor, or, oh, that reminds me of this paper that I wrote. Like, does that appear anywhere or anywhere in the book? Oh yeah, for for sure. I th there's nothing more that that I enjoy when when you know reading or or watching uh, TVs or movies or what have you is being put or, or watching the characters being put in this quote unquote impossible situation from a moral or or philosophical standpoint. Because yeah, you know they got to think about it, but let's be real, the questions are really for us um that that's why they're they're being brought up um and as i was writing this i was i had this checklist in my mind like i needed s at least some kind of moral debate to be either explicitly argued about or more often than not implicitly uh hinted at every you know five or six uh chapters because i i wanted i wanted that that philosophical stimulation. I want the the thoughts to be provoked in in ways that aren't just you know 
for looking at the subtext, say, of, of some character. I, I, I want, I, I always need there to be some kind of moral gray, so to speak. Um, and that definitely came out because I tried um, real hard to, to include moral conflict. Um, sometimes it's explicitly, you know, why are you doing X? Because I have to, it's my job. It's because of honor and, you know, what's honor, blah, 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 those, those, those kind of things. Um, and especially in, in a world um, where, where you have magic and, and, and deities floating around in the mix, the idea of morality becomes a lot different because you have all these extra layers added on to the world. Um, so yeah, I guess that, that was, that was my long answer. No, it was, it was a perfect answer. So, and it's, it's a great segue into, um, I think what will be probably the last question I ask y'all before we move on to the Q and A portion of this it's so I think the biggest thing that I've gotten from just hearing both of you speak is when you have a passion for something, like when you decided that you wanted to write this book, it was impossible for you to not draw upon so many lived experiences, be it your, you know, college classes or be it books that you've read, you know, growing up, you know, how you personally have evolved, you know, from being a shy middle schooler to being, you know, an out, outgoing college student, you know, et cetera. So I really feel like as cheesy as it sounds, because I don't have another um, analogy right now, I think art definitely imitates life based off of what I've gotten from this conversation. So what advice would you have to anyone in the audience who has that thing that they want to work on? You know, like Shane, you said you did the first nine chapters, didn't touch it for a year, then you came back to it, then you finally brought yourself to publish it. Same thing with UG, you know, it's you've always wanted to do art, but sometimes you haven't been always confident about what you're going to do with your art, but then you have your Etsy shop, you put yourself out there. What advice would you give to people who have that thing that they want to work on, but they don't really know where to start. You know, like that's, I, I think that's the, the big question right now. It's what, especially now during quarantine, you know, we're now we're a year into um, just trying to figure out how to navigate the world around us in a new way. It's what would you say to people who have a thing that they want to create, but they don't know how to do it, or they're too shy to do it? I, I can take it for a second. <laughs> she it's just looking like I right, go for it. Um, I've been taking a look at the Q and A's, and some of them are related to this. So um, I think you know, it was really at college because I've always drawn my entire life, but it was really starting at Lehman, starting at Macaulay, where my creativity was really pushed and challenged. Um, the first Macaulay seminar, if y'all remember, has to do with arts in New York City. So starting from there, um, I have Professor Paris, who later on was also my English, um, the second English class professor. And she was instrumental in really pushing my boundaries when it comes to creativity. Well, in there, it was about writing. In general, she just pushed me to like, and made me like grow in confidence. But one thing that you'll find similar to me and Shane, I think he wrote the nine chapters. He didn't write until a friend encouraged and then was like, okay, you need to write this. I actually didn't even open my, I, I didn't, I opened this Etsy shop in the, in the middle of the pandemic in August of 2020 because friends pushed me to do it. So I think more than anything else, it's having a community of people who support you, who hold you accountable, who are challenging you is so important in pursuing whatever side thing that you have right now, because I know for a fact, Shane continues to like push me to draw like this new book that we're working on. He knows how long I've been working on this one book cover, one book cover. I've been sending him like multiple things, but he would push me to, okay, how about you imagine it this way? He's not even an artist, but he gives me that like perspective of, okay, how does this look like to someone who isn't an artist who is trying, trying to bring this to life. I'm not a super visual person, but most, a lot of people are. How does that look like for them? I know Shane is super visual. So it's like, okay, how does that look like for them? But it's so integral and so important to have that kind of community. Um, 
And I know it sounds difficult, like how do you just surround yourself with people? But part of that had to do with Macaulay for me. I, because of Macaulay, because we had Gary Schwartz, because of Gary, like he really pushed me to like really connect with my, with my cohort, with um, people in like Victoria, who's in, not in my cohort, but like we were able to connect because of that. And um, you join clubs, you talk to your professors. I know the philosophy majors, the three of us know our philosophy professors were so willing to talk to us all the time. Like I've personally talked to some of my professors for three to four hours at a time over phone call. Like they're so, having that support system is so important. So it's honestly not even about how amazingly talented you are. It's really having that group of people who really like push you past that. Yeah, for for sure. I I I definitely want to say that that, you know, a long break I took in between having finished my first nine chapters and then deciding to continue that journey and finish uh, writing the first draft. Um the probably one of the main things, if not the the biggest thing, I would say is um the the study abroad trip I did through Lehman we went to Crete for the entire month of June, took a nice little weekend trip to Athens as well, which was great. Um, but yeah, you know, I've, I've never been to Greece. I've never been to Italy. Um, I've never been to any of the historical places that I wanted to write about and that I love so much. So having the opportunity to to do that study abroad trip, yeah, I, I originally being my shy, somewhat introverted self. I didn't even want to go. I mean, yeah, it was cool. I really wanted to go, but for everyone else, I didn't want to go. Um, and not only did my friends tell me to go, my parents told me to go, my advisors told me to go. I think the, the biggest proponent to, to tell me to go was probably um, Professor Marionetti, the, the current chair of the history department. She was very, very adamant that I go to Crete because I took three classes with her all around uh, Greek history, Greek culture, Greek drama. And she basically told me, if you don't go, I will fail you in this. No, she didn't really tell me that. But she she was really trying to to get me to go, uh, like going, going above and beyond. And to, to answer the question of uh, doing something that you're perhaps slightly hesitant to do, you know, maybe taking the step towards a dream, like G said, I would definitely say it has to do with surrounding yourself with friends, but also as cliche as this sounds, it's it's really just overcoming your own uh, your own fear, your own stubbornness, your own insert quality or emotion here, right? Because you are your own worst enemy. Again, very cliche, um, but I think once once you're able to to get past that, you just kind of got to go for it right because I even as I was writing the first book I I didn't I, I didn't feel that confident because the only person who's really seeing it was myself um and yes the community around me helped me a lot that and I'm not trying to discredit that in any way I don't think I would have been able to accomplish what I accomplished without my uh Macaulay support my advisory support, my friend's support uh, within the community around Lehman and, and Macaulay. Um, but I think the most important thing is to stop stepping over your own feet and just going for it. Because if you don't go for it, no one else is gonna. I love that. So I'm just looking, we have about 10 more minutes, just about 10 more minutes left. So I'm looking at the questions, please keep typing them. We will answer all of them. So the first one that I want to address is how did you decide upon the title? So the title was probably the hardest part of the book for me. I hate titles. Um, you're, you're essentially tying a little bow upon all this writing. Um, and when I was, first deciding on the title, I didn't even think it was going to be a series. I just thought this was a one and done. Um, and I remember talking to a few friends, throwing some ideas by them, most of which were rejected because they didn't really, 
uh, get across what the book was trying to get across. Um, and I, th I want to say I gave the title about a month or two of thought before actually settling down on my first real option, um, which was Lost Soul Singular. Um, and this is before I thought it was going to be a seri series. And then, you know, I let that sit for a minute. And by a minute, I mean a month. Um, and then the thought occurred to me, well, I left, you know, as, as every uh, annoying writer does, uh, some cliffhangers. And I was like, well, maybe this should be a series. So maybe Lost Soul isn't exactly the most operative title here. Uh, so I started brainstorming some other ideas. And after getting some rejections from various friends on many other ideas for titles, um, A Servant of Death stuck out. Um, in part, yes, I, I was criticized for being edgy by, by a few. Um, but at the same time, as as the back of the book blurb states, you know, Ander Frost has a, a relationship with death. Um, and then the epigraph came out where I kind of did, you know, a Lord of the Rings kind of thing where I plan on putting the epigraph in front of, or at the start of every book to seem like a prophecy and a servant of death showed up in that epigraph. And I was like, huh, this is starting to make a lot of sense now that I'm starting to think about the future. Um, and the feedback from my friends that I got from Lost Soul was so good that I decided to make it the series title, um, just pluralize it, add, add that pesky little S. And Lost Soul is a Servant of Death ended up being the final title because, well, you'll have to read to, to figure out the true extent of the meaning. But yes, that, that, that was the story of Long Rejections. I love that. And in true author, Arthur, um, what's the word I'm looking for? In the true spirit and true style of an Arthur, you just sort of threw out that little cliffhanger there. So I like what you did there. All right. I'm looking at some other ones. Hi, Shane and Victoria. Hi, Winter. Hello. Nice to see you again. Thank you for the shout out. Um, okay. So we have another question from Quandell, who, hello, Quandell, co-worker of mine from Lehman and also one of Shane's good friends. So another like little Lehman family connection. The question is, if you can remember, Shane, how long did it take you to edit your writing and get to the final version of the book, which I'm actually very curious about too. Well, the the initial manuscript, you know, the, the year gap between the first nine chapters and what followed aside, um, it didn't actually take me very long to finish writing the first manuscript because I was extremely, emphasis on extremely, creatively motivated to continue writing. Um, God bless my beta readers, you know who you are. Um, and the, getting the first, manu the, the first draft of the manuscript out took me about a month and a half because I was rolling through a chapter or two a day um, and I was getting feedback almost instantaneously. You know, I, I would roll a chapter or two out, someone would read it, we would get feedback and it'd be great. And then I kept writing the next day. Um, and after that, I wanna say it was when it got harder because as especially this goes for, for any creative kind of profession, you, you hate, you know, editing your own work because you think your own work is beautiful and it's gorgeous and you want to keep it just the way it is. Um, but we all know, no, 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 that, that's not how this works. Um, so editing took me, I want to say around three to four months um, because I am the only editor here, um, aside from once again, God bless you, my beta readers. Um, but I, I ran, I read through it quite a few times to, to make sure what what I could see made sense grammatically, of course, and I wasn't creating draggy sentences, so to speak. Um, and then I kind of held on to it for a while without doing anything. 
because I was hesitant to publish, as, as I mentioned before. So I created some distance between myself and my, my, my uh, book. And then I came back to it a few months later and decided, you know, why don't I give it another round of editing because I'm a different person now than I was when I finished my editing. So I read over it a couple more times, made some edits according to my newfound knowledge of my amazing uh, creative writing classes at Lehman. Um, thanks to Professor Chapel and Professor Bryant, wherever they are, you guys helped me a lot. Um, and once that round of edits was completed, I got in contact with Victoria to find an illustrator. And then while that was being illustrated, I figured why not go over it again? So I did that. And then I finally pulled the, pull, the trigger finger on it. I love that. Well, um, if that is the timeline that we're working under, I'm not gonna put any pressure on you to like come out with a new book, but um, we would love to see a new book perhaps by the end of 2021. I'm doing the evil thinking fingers. Is that a yes, it's possible? Or is that a no, Victoria? Shut up, it's not happening. Is that, okay, cool. <laughs> so, all right, so the, the second, the second um, installment is of Lost Souls is to be determined, but um, this has been an absolute highlight of my week. This is something that I've been looking forward to for so long, just being able to geek up Shane's book and G's amazing illustration. So if y'all have not, gotten a copy of Lost Souls, A Servant of Death, you should definitely do that. It's available on Amazon. And also um, as Charmaine mentioned in the chat earlier, we're going to be doing a giveaway. So thank you so much for coming out to this. I'm gonna hand it back over to Charmaine, um, but thank you all for tuning in tonight. This has been super duper exciting. Yes, it has. Thank you so much, Victoria. You've been amazing asking great questions. And thank you to the audience um, for your great questions as well. There is one person that I'd just like to shout out who's in the audience, and that's Mark Kowalski. Thank you so much for joining us. And I know Shane knows you very, very well. So we appreciate you being here with us tonight. And just to let you know what's coming up um, the next upcoming event, we are going to be looking also at a few more Lehman students, um, Lehman and Hunter students, and they were on the front lines of the pandemic. So please tune in April 9th at 6 p.m. to hear the Yassin family's um, story during the COVID times. So again, on behalf of Dean Mary Pearl and the Macaulay community, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Be well.